Hello, I'm Tina Olke and your instructor for Psych 155. Today we're going to get to dip our toes into psychological disorders. Chapter 14 is one of those chapters where I wish we could spend hours on. Psychological disorders never stops to fascinate me. I do hope that you enjoy learning about anxiety, mood, and eating disorders, schizophrenia, disassociative disorders, which are formally called multiple personality disorders, and then of course, personality disorders. For today's mini lesson, I'll be giving you an introduction as to how we get to the diagnoses of disorders. What is ab abnormal behavior and who gets to decide what it is? These are just a few of the questions we'll be looking into during today's mini lesson. Defining abnormal behavior isn't easy as it sounds. Psychopathology takes an attempt at it. It's a study of abnormal behavior. Psychological disorders are any patterns of behavior that causes people significant distress, harm to others, or damages their ability to function in daily life. It is statistically rare and deviant from social norms in that it differs from society's ideas about proper functioning. For example, not wearing clothing in a society that says it's a norm to wear clothing. That's abnormal. The situational context also has to do with defining abnormality. This is the social or environmental setting of a person's behavior. For example, if a man says that people are listening in on his phone conversations, you might say that this is an abnormal behavior. However, if I say he works for military intelligence, it might put this into context. There are two qualifiers of situational context, and those are subjective discomfort, which is that the person must experience emotional distress or emotional pain when engaging in an activity. For example, a person might experience fear when leaving her house or fear when going around dogs. The second qualifier is that it is maladaptive or it is anything that does not allow a person to function within or adapt to the stresses and everyday de demands of life. It becomes so upsetting, distracting, or confusing for people that they cannot really care for themselves or work productively. This also includes behavior that might bring relief or help them really cope with the situation but does have a harmful effects like cutting or drinking. Abnormality can be looked at from a sociocultural perspective as well. Cultural relativity needs to be taken into account. For example, what is considered normal in one culture might be abnormal in another. And there might be culture-bound syndromes in that some disorders might be found in one particular culture, but not another, or at least not prevalent in those cultures. For example, eating disorders is primarily a Western culture disorder. So how do we define behavior as abnormal? We can ask ourselves a series of questions. For example, is the behavior unusual? Does the behavior go against social norms? Does the behavior cause a person significant subjective discomfort? Is the behavior maladaptive or results in an inability to function? Does the behavior cause a person to be dangerous to their self or others? After we have reached a conclusion and are ready to make a diagnosis, those in the psychology field do, do use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 4th edition text revision, or the DSM-4TR to diagnose their clients with specific disorders. The DSM lists approximately 400 mental disorders if you do include the subcategories of the disorders. It lists the criteria for diagnosing this disorder and the key clinical features. There are five axes in the DSM-4TR, which do include the clinical disorders, the personality disorders, general medical conditions, psychosocial and environmental problems, and a global assessment of functioning. Over one-fifth of all adults have over 18 have a mental disorder in any given year. As a mental health professional assesses the client, they use all the axes of the DSM to reach a diagnosis for the client. Axis 1 is used primarily for clinical disorders, such as depression. Axis 1 is what most people are diagnosed with. Axis 2 are developmental and personality disorders and mental retardation. Axis 3 are medical conditions such as diabetes or flu. Axis 4 are stressors of life such as school or housing problems or the death of a spouse. Axis 5 is the Global Assessment of Functioning Scale, or GAF. This is where the client is rated on the psychological, 
social, and occupational functioning on a scale of 1 to 100. As I said before, all axes are used for each client. So say a, a person named April comes into therapy and she might have the following diagnosis. On axis 1, she would be giving a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder. Axis 2 would be borderline personality disorder. Axis 3 would be diabetes. Axis 4 would be she might have terminated her engagement recently. And axis 5, her GAF would be a score of 55. This table shows a listing of the, uh, the axis 1 disorders that are included in the DSM-4-TR. It includes a brief listing and descriptions of some of the disorders that you'll read about during your chapter this week. I hope that you find your time learning about the different disorders informative and interesting. For today, this concludes what we'll be covering in our PowerPoint mini lesson. The Reflective Log Assignment asks you to suggest ideas for future research designed to advance knowledge on some of the concepts in this chapter, or to apply the material learned in the chapter to a current news issue or to experiences in your own life. Today, we only really introduce psychological disorders, the how we get to the definition of abnormality and diagnosing a disorder. I'd like to hear what your thoughts were on it. After reading the chapter, what were your thoughts about the different disorders presented? Did you have any questions? And what have you seen in the news recently that you'd like to comment on? There are a lot of ideas out there from chapter 15 that you can discuss, and I can't wait to read your logs this week.